Until the 11th century, confrontations between Europeans and Arabs had usually taken place on European soil. But then the situation began to change, the Pisans and Genos conducted pillaging expeditions in North Africa, then came the Christian conquest of Mediterranean islands such as Sicily, which the Normans conquered between 1061 and 1091, and then the First Crusade, launched in 1095, which culminated in the taking of Jerusalem in July 1099, and the formation of the Latin states in the east, the county of Tripoli, the Principality of Anj, and the county of Edessa. It should be pointed out, first, that the troops who captured Jerusalem in 1099 were not aware that they were participating in a crusade, it was not until the 13th century that canonists explicitly used the term crociata. Contemporaries linked their expedition to a pilgrimage, they called it ita, via, or peregrinatio, the soldiers were usually peregrini, sometimes crucignati. In fact, when Pope Urban II launched his appeal in Claremont in 1095, he presented the expedition as an armed pilgrimage, and offered participants the same indulgences that were granted to pilgrims going to Jerusalem. The vow to set off was also assimilated to a vow of pilgrimage, the pilgrim had a cross sewn into his or her clothing to mark that pledge. The chroniclers, therefore, have a tendency to present these mighty armies as bands of humble pilgrims headed for Jerusalem. At the same time, however, they call them soldiers of Christ, or the army of God. They present the Christian army as heir to the army of Israel in the Old Testament. The chronicler Robert the Monk relates that, after the decisive victory of Dorylaeum, which opened eastern Anatolia to God's army, the victorious soldiers sang a hymn to God, adapting the one Moses had uttered to thank him for destroying Pharaoh's army, thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power, thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Of course, the words of Exodus were more likely to flow from a monk's pen than from the lips of soldiers, but at least this passage says a great deal about how a certain monastic elite perceived the expedition. Robert was not alone, other chroniclers established a close parallel between the army of Israel and the militia Dei that set out to conquer Jerusalem. That view, of course, required that the adversary be portrayed as the enemy of God. In the chronicle of Robert the monk, Pope Urban II, launching the appeal for the First Crusade, painted a very dark picture, from the East news was arriving that the Persians, a despised race, had invaded the lands of the Christians in those regions, sowing destruction, spilling blood, and spreading fire. In addition, these enemies of God were said to have destroyed churches, overturned altars, circumcised Christians by force, and poured the blood from these circumcisions onto altars and into baptismal fonts. In Robert the Monk's Chronicle, the Turks have become Persians, and he readily attributes the worst atrocities to them. According to him, the goal of the expedition was to rescue these Eastern Christians, and to avenge them, but also to recover the territories unjustly taken by the infidels, and to return the sanctuaries profaned by them to the Christian faith. Most of these authors knew nothing about Islam, but they made up for their ignorance, by using their imaginations, and their knowledge, acquired through books, of other discredited beliefs, those of the pagans of antiquity. Not all chroniclers depicted the Muslim adversary as an idolater, however. One of the chroniclers of the First Crusade provides a very different image of Muhammad. Gibeir of Nogent declares that Muhammad is not the god of the Saracens, as some think, but that the Saracens believe he is a just man and their patron, through whom divine laws were transmitted. Gibeir inserts a short biography of Muhammad into his chronicle, The Deeds of God Through the Franks. He knows that the Saracens worship only God the Father, that they reject the Trinity, and that they believe Jesus was a man and a prophet but not God. According to Gibeir, that Mathomas, with the aid of a heretical Christian, compiled a law that gave them free reign for every kind of shameful behavior. To make the Arabs believe he was a prophet, Muhammad trained a dove to eat seeds from his ear, so that people would believe it was an angel from heaven. He attached the scrolls of his law to the horns of a cow, then celebrated its advent as a miracle. That new law, acclaimed by the crowd, encouraged excesses of the flesh, polygamy, prostitution, homosexuality. As a just punishment for his crimes, Mathomas endured a horrible death, first afflicted with epilepsy, he was later devoured by flatulent pigs. The stories of false miracles resemble those told about the heresy arcs, these deceptions, inspired by the devil, supposedly explain why the mob embraced the heresies. The ideological function of that life of Muhammad, placed at the beginning of Gibeir's chronicle, is clear, it serves as a justification for the crusade. 
Gibea declares that the Eastern Christians were too clever and that their ratiocination led them to fall into every sort of heresy. Islam is said to be only the most recent and most catastrophic manifestation of these heretical tendencies. The message is simple, the Eastern peoples need Westerners to put their affairs in order. The denigration of the Prophet is a key element in the justification of the Crusade. Other Crusade chroniclers followed Gibea's lead. William, Archbishop of Tyre, presents Muhammad as the firstborn of Satan, a madman, and liar who seduced Arabia. The disciples of such a man could have no political legitimacy in the land of Christ. Whereas the chroniclers depict the Crusades as a reconquest of the patrimony of Christ unduly usurped by the infidels, canon law gave a legal framework to the war, which was waged under ecclesiastical authority to assert the rights of the Church. The Concordia Discordantium Cononum from the mid-12th century is an encyclopedic compilation attributed to Gratian that became the foundation for the entire system of canon law in the Middle Ages. The decretum is divided into various causae. The causa that interests us is the 23rd, which deals with the legitimacy of war waged under church authority against the heretics. The Pope ordered the bishops of the neighboring regions, who had accepted civil jurisdiction from the hands of the emperor, to defend the Catholics against the heretics. These bishops, having accepted that apostolic mandate, summoned troops and began to fight the heretics, both openly and by ruse. Many heretics were killed, others despoiled of their own property and that of their churches, others were imprisoned or reduced to slavery, while still others were compelled to return to the unity of the Catholic faith. Many historians, with some justification, have seen this causa as an allusion to the First Crusade. The 13th and 14th century, canonists make reference to this causa when they speak of the Crusades. The parallels between the First Crusade and the case at hand are too numerous to be fortuitous, they include the power of the Pope to call the Millites to arms for the defence of oppressed Christians, and the right of the victors to appropriate the property of the defeated and to establish their power over the conquered territories. There can be no doubt that Gratian is seeking to affirm the legitimacy of the First Crusade. But he also provides criteria for judging the legitimacy of any sort of military action, offensive or defensive, undertaken under the Church's authority. Gratian obviously does not intend to rule on the legality of the Crusades as such, since the concept of Crusade did not yet exist. He poses the problem much more broadly. For him, it seems, the legal precedent for the First Crusade was the fight against the Donatist heretics of North Africa in the 4th and 5th centuries. In both cases, the aim was to re-establish Roman authority over those who rebelled against it and to assist the Catholic Christians being persecuted by the heretics. If Gratian presents the bishops' adversaries as heretics, it is because, by the 12th century, that was how the Muslims were viewed, as we have seen in the examples of Gibert of Nogent's and William of Tyre's chronicles. It is therefore possible to apply that, cause a dealing with heretics to the Saracens. As in each of Gratian's causae, the hypothetical case is followed by a series of questions proceeding from it. He considers, among other things, the legitimacy of the war, the duty of aiding one's comrades, the punishment for the guilty, and the authority of various individuals to call people to arms against the heretics. In his seventh question, Gratian asks whether the possessions of the heretics and their churches may be confiscated, and whether good Christians may seize them. In his responses, he asserts the legitimacy of the conquest and of the appropriation of lands and other property. True to the incipient scholastic style of the 12th century, Gratian cites authorities for and against each of his propositions, biblical passages, ecumenical councils, pontifical bulls, and church fathers, Jerome, Gregory the Great, and especially Augustine, who provides most of the citations. This preference for the Bishop of Hippo is altogether logical. In his writings on the Donatists, Augustine justifies the use of arms in the service of the Catholic Church against the heretics. Augustine was not the first to refuse them civil rights. Under Constantine, heretics were already deprived of privilegia. By the 4th century, heresy was assimilated to a crime of less majest, even treason, in imperial legislation. In the For Excerpts for Quaestio 7, which articulates the right of Christians to appropriate the property of heretics, Gratian cites the Bishop of Hippo exclusively. According to Augustine, the Donatists had placed themselves outside the law, having rebelled against both divine law and human law, they had no legitimate title to possess goods. Gratian follows Augustine, 
and stipulates the right of Catholics to confiscate the heretics' possessions, thus offering a justification for conquest at their expense. That justification became authoritative and constituted the starting point for any reflection on the subject by 12th and 13th century canonists. For the canonist Huguccio, who taught in Bologna in the late 12th century, the war against the heretics was authorized by both human and divine law. Canon three of the Fourth Late Rand Council imposed on prelates the duty to combat heresy and to mobilize princes to drive out the heretics, granting Catholics the right to confiscate their personal property. The Decretis Laurentius Hispanus declared that Causa 23 conferred legitimacy on any war against heretics or Saracens. The theologians who addressed Causa 23 were generally of the same opinion. For the Franciscan Alexander of Hales, the Crusaders' despoliation of heretics and Saracens was a meritorious act. Some jurists hesitated, however, to relegate the Saracens to the rank of heretics, especially since, like the Jews, many Muslims possessed the status of a subaltern minority tolerated in Spain, Sicily, and the Latin states of the East. A few canonists presented the war against the Saracens rather as a restoration of legitimate Christian power, which the infidels had supposedly usurped. The 13th-century Dominican jurist Raymond of Penyafort, in his Summa de Cassibus, recognizes that the Saracens may legitimately reign, but not in territories they acquired at the expense of Christians. The Christian conquest of Muslim territories became legitimate when it was a reconquest of formerly Christian lands, the Holy Land, Spain, or other parts of the former Roman Empire. That is also the opinion of other 13th-century canonists, such as William of Wren and Johannes de Deo, and of theologians such as Robert of Corkin. Pope Innocent IV confirmed the right to reconquest. Thomas of Aquinas goes even farther, for him, infidels cannot rule over Christians, and the Church has the right to abolish that domination. In their work, therefore, 13th century jurists followed Ingratian's footsteps, declaring categorically the legitimacy of the reconquest of the Christian territories of the Roman Empire, where the heretics, including the Saracens, did not have the right to exercise power.